In this video, I'm going to express my anger at a certain group of people. I'm doing so because I have read too many opinion pieces and reviews by so-called video game journalists who, quite honestly, don't know what the hell they are talking about. I've kept my mouth shut for years, but I'm sick of it. This video is my response to all their shoddy journalism. In the past few years, a number of supposedly reputable video game reviewers have been referring to games such as Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest as Japanese role-playing games, or JRPG for short. The problem is, that genre doesn't exist. The genre these games actually belong to is called console-style RPG in the West and light RPG in Japan, and we have been using these genre labels since the 1980s. I have no idea why the current generation of reviewers need to invent a new term to describe games which have been around for three decades, especially when their term is kind of racist. Not only that, but Japanese RPG is a terrible term simply because a large number of role-playing video games made in Japan do not fit the console-style RPG genre. They make all kinds of computer RPG games. For example, roguelikes are still very popular in Japan, as are PC-style RPGs, action RPGs, and strategy RPGs. Therefore, if the JRPG label is thrown around at all, it should be used in a broad, non-genre specific way to refer to all role-playing games which come out of Japan. This includes tabletop RPGs like Sword World. This is the same way we use the label Japanime, which is often shortened to anime. Anime is an art style and an industry, but it is not a genre. With the exception of a few industry unique genres, anime falls under the same genres as any other film medium. Calling a film anime tells us what style it was animated in, and usually where it was created, but it doesn't really tell us anything about the film itself. The same goes for JRPG. It's an industry, not a genre. Stop using a racist term to describe gameplay genres. Hell, there are a number of console-style RPGs created by non-Japanese developers, so trying to claim all the games of this genre come from Japan is rather absurd. As I mentioned earlier, in Japan, these games are called light RPG. Obviously, this label won't work well for English speakers because it sounds too similar to the rules light RPG genre of tabletop RPGs. But in order to understand what makes a game belong to this genre, we need to examine the label. First, we need some information on computer RPG history, which takes us to Wizardry, proving grounds of the Mad Overlord. Wizardry was one of the first massively popular graphical dungeon crawlers and was released on various home computers. Although the game was widely distributed in 1981, the game started development in 1979 and saw limited release in 1980. It was programmed by Andrew Greenberg and Robert Woodhead, who were most certainly inspired by text-based computer games. But Wizardry was not released in Japan, at least not in the early 80s. In fact, graphical dungeon crawlers remained unknown to Japanese gamers until the Black Onyx was released in 1984 for the NEC PC-88, a personal computer that was popular in Japan at the time. See, the Black Onyx was created by Hank Rogers, a young college graduate living in Japan as a foreigner. Hank Rogers was an avid RPG game player with both Dungeons and & Dragons and Wizardry among the games he played. Hank, realizing these games were unknown to Japan, decided to program one in the Japanese language because he felt the gameplay would be successful in that market. Hank was very correct, and after the Black Onyx became extremely popular, Japanese gamers started to import Wizardry until Wizardry was officially translated into Japanese and ported over in the late 80s. Now, another series of games we need to know about is the Ultima games, created by Richard Garrett. Richard Garriott was the creator of one of the most influential computer RPG games of the time, a graphical dungeon crawler called Akalabeth that he released in 1979. Due to the popularity of Akalabeth, he created the Ultima games which had improved graphics and more detailed combat systems. The first three Ultima games are among those that were imported by Japanese gamers after the release of the Black Onus. Now for those of you who have never played an old school computer RPG dungeon crawler, let me explain their basic gameplay elements. Firstly. Their combat systems are almost completely derived from Dungeons and Dragons, right down to how dice rolling determines how much damage characters deal. Turn-based combat is also a crucial element not just because of hardware limitations, but because the D&D uses turn-based combat. Secondly, they have character creation systems highly derived from D&D. There is allocation of attribute points for new characters, and players also choose names, races, and classes for the characters. Characters can also permanently die. Lastly, the games are almost exclusively about dungeon crawling. In fact, the game itself is nothing more than exploring a dungeon or a series of dungeons, often without the game telling you map layouts or any in-game hints on how to solve puzzles. Players need to make their own maps with graph paper. 
If the game had a plot, it's really nothing more than a footnote in the instruction manual, and it serves more as an excuse for players to dungeon crawl than any other reason. The games may as well not even have plots because the gameplay is totally detached from the storyline. From among the Japanese fans of dungeon crawlers came Yuji Hori, a hobbyist game programmer with a degree in literature. Yuji worked for Annex, a small Japanese publisher of computer games. When Annex started developing games for the Famicom, Yuji decided to create a dungeon crawler like the ones he loved, but with significant improvements. The result was Dragon Quest, which NX released in 1986. Now some so-called professional game journalists have claimed Ultima 3, which came out in 1983, has a very similar gameplay to Dragon Quest. By this logic, they have claimed that all Yuji Horii did was copy Ultima 3. Unfortunately, these journalists do not know what the hell they are talking about. In those essays, they have cited their beliefs based on the NES version of Ultima 3. What they have failed to consider is that the NES version of Ultima 3 had its command menus changed to resemble Dragon Quest, and has tons of NPC dialogue that was never in the original version. You can't even say that the NES port influenced Dragon Quest 2, because Dragon Quest 2 came out in January 1987. The NES port of Ultima 3 came out 9 months later, in October of that year. But this should be obvious by simply looking at the combat systems of these games. Ultima 3 has a very tactical combat system that has a concept of rage, and neither Dragon Quest or Final Fantasy make such distinctions. If anything, Ultima 3 inspired the genre of strategy RPG games, but that's a topic for another day. So when I say that Dragon Quest is the first game of its genre, I say this with a great deal of confidence in my research. I have played the original Ultima and Wizardry games, and Dragon Quest is significantly different than those games. Wizardry and Ultima certainly influenced Yuji Horii to create Dragon Quest, but they influenced him to improve on their design, not copy it. There are two big things that Yuji Horii did with his game that have defined the light RPG genre. Number one, Dragon Quest had lighter mechanics than Wizardry and Ultima. This is the most important part that people who lack game design knowledge usually miss. Dragon Quest has much more user-friendly gameplay than any computer RPG that came before it. I've been told this is the reason they are called light RPGs in Japan, and it makes sense when you think about it. Dungeon crawlers like Wizardry and Ultima require the player to use a keyboard to type out commands, and these commands need to be remembered. One example is that the names of magic spells in Wizardry need to be typed out in order to be cast. So if you forgot what the spells were called, you couldn't cast any spells at all. Some games even had more than just spells. You also needed to keep track of all the skills and items a character had. So let's say you lost your instruction book that listed all these commands. Your dog chewed it up, your mom cleaned your room and threw it in the trash. You lost it because you don't take care of your things. Whatever. You are pretty much screwed without that book and your journal of notes. Dragon Quest resolved this problem by allowing you to simply select what actions you wanted to perform from a small menu. If you think this is only because the Nintendo lacked a keyboard, then you are incredibly ignorant about video game history. The Japanese version of the NES, called the Famicom, did indeed have a keyboard attachment which people could buy. This keyboard came out in 1984 and Dragon Quest came out in 1986. So if the developer really wanted to create a dungeon crawler for the Famicom that used a keyboard, Yuji Horii would have done so. It is therefore an intentional design goal to make a dungeon crawler with simple menus to make the game more user friendly, which is a core part of the console style RPG genre. And before some ignorant moron comments on my video and says, but Wizardry for the NES also uses menus like that, Wizardry was not ported to the NES until 1987. Dragon Quest came out in 1986. The NES port imitates the gameplay improvements created by Dragon Quest, not the other way around. Dragon Quest also removed the need to spend attribute points on characters or choose classes and races. You couldn't make a crappy character by misspending points or choosing the wrong race or class. Dragon Quest also lacked character permadeath and the mind boggling stupid ways you can die. For example, in Wizardry, you can have traps teleport your whole party into a wall, instantly killing your entire party off. If you don't have any other characters waiting in that town, you'll have to spend hours re-leveling a whole new party to go into the dungeon to rescue them. And once you do bring their bodies back to town, they might permadie when the priest tries to res them. Dragon Quest also had a pretty easy to understand system for damage. More expensive weapons dealt more damage, and more expensive armor reduced more damage. Rather than the completely arbitrary cost of items in wizardry, where good items were often cheaper than crappy items. Lastly, and this is probably the most important gameplay design element, Dragon Quest did not have a third person perspective when you enter a dungeon. Instead, the character just walks around the map the same way they do on the overworld, which is uniquely different than the Ultima games which switched to a third-person perspective when you went into a dungeon. This meant you no longer had players getting massively confused about where they were, and Drag Quest players never experienced the trapped-in-hell feeling one gets from its predecessors. With these facts in mind, we can see how Dragon Quest branched into a different direction by doing the opposite of what its predecessors did. Rather than make more complicated methods of controlling and creating characters, it made a simpler one. 
To navigate around the world, you no longer needed to draw detailed maps of dungeons on graph paper, and to play the games, you no longer needed a journal full of notes on coordinates, spell names, the different weapon damages, or what keyboard commands did what actions. You don't even need to read the damn instruction manual to play the frickin' game, because gameplay is intuitive, and NPCs will tell you anything that's not. Dragon Quest is a work of genius, and by just looking at its design, you can understand why it had mass success. It was a dungeon crawler for the everyman. Continued in part two.